Hi guys. We'll give it another minute and then we'll get started. If you guys had a chance to see, but on our Canvas page, um, I put a copy of our lecture video from yesterday. There's a link to that up on our Canvas page. Unfortunately, the waiting room wasn't set up right, so the um, video actually is about you know 20 minutes longer than it needs to be because it was recording people who were waiting for the meeting to start. Um, <clears throat> when I uploaded the video to my YouTube page, I cut out that portion of it, and then um, today's lecture video should be just our lecture and not um, everybody hanging around waiting for me to show up. Um, okay. So we'll give it maybe like one more minute and then we can go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to finish up chapter 1.1 today and then we'll start chapter 1.2. Um, and then we'll have some time at the end to maybe work on some classwork problems. And then um, we'll, we'll do some classwork problems for 1.1 and then also 1.2. And then <coughs> and then I can answer questions um, about those classwork problems that you want, um, that you may have. And remember, um, the classwork problems I'm going to be um, having you guys pass them in. I just set up a, um, a time and a date when those were, um, you know, set to be passed in. But uh, I'm, like I said before, I'm checking for completion on those um, and just sort of a reasonable effort. So, you know, um, don't sweat it if you're not understanding what you need to do. Um, also, I think uh, it's sort of flexible about when you pass it in. But, you know, if you can pass them in by the quiz time, which will be next week, then we should be good to go. Okay. So um, just a quick review. So yesterday <clears throat> we were talking a lot about um, vocabulary and making sure that we were all on the same page about stuff. We talked about um, sort of our dimensional space, right? One dimension, two dimension, three dimensions. And then we talked about the difference between a point and a vector. And then when we talked about vector addition, like two vectors here, and we talked about the parallelogram rule for adding vectors. Okay, so that was um, example seven from our lecture examples. When we finish up chapter 1.1 today, I'll scan this in and then upload it into our Canvas page um, later today. So you guys will have that as a reference point too. Okay. So our parallelogram rule from yesterday, remember, if I've got <coughs> a vector and another vector, they form together um, a parallelogram like this. You can imagine that there's another vector W here that's like parallel to this one and another vector V here that's parallel to this one the addition of V and W is the diagonal of that parallelogram. Okay, it's our parallelogram rule for vectors. Okay. <clears throat> right. So um, with that, I'm going to continue on. Um, we're talking about like mathematical properties of um, vectors. So another mathematical property that I wanted to talk about was what we call scalar multiplication. So now while a vector has magnitude and direction, a scalar is just a number. Scalars like three or zero or pi or um, any other particular number um, itself. And when we talk about um, operations that we can do on, hang on, operations that we can do on vectors, okay, we can add and subtract, we can multiply by scalars. We can also multiply two vectors with each other. That's, um, we're gonna cover those in later chapters. Um, vector vector multiplication is um, a more complex uh, topic that we're going to actually spend a lot of time on. But for today, we're just going to talk about um, scalar multiplication. So we're going to say a scalar is a number. And we're going to just talk about real numbers, okay? So it's just a plain old number, right? Um, and I can reference this by like some letter A or B or C or whatever. But you notice it doesn't have a little arrow over the top. And if it doesn't have an arrow over the top, it's just a scalar, okay? So if I want to multiply, I've got some vector V, let's say vector V, um, which has components V1, V2, and so on and so forth, all the way up to however high a dimension that we're operating in with our vector. If 
I want to multiply this vector by my scalar, I'd write it like this, a times b. And what that means is I take this scalar, this number, and I distribute it to all these components inside my vector. So this becomes a v1, a v2, a v n, all the way through. <clears throat> Okay, um, this is basically scaling the length of the vector, okay? So I multiply that scalar, we're gonna, well actually run through a bunch of examples, but I multiply that component, every component by that scalar. So it scales the length of it, okay? So we can say also that if A, the scalar, is a negative number, negative one, negative five, whatever, okay? Then what it does is <clears throat> it also flips the direction of the vector. We're gonna graph these out so you can see what it looks like, okay? So let's say, for example, if I have, so if I've got my vector B, okay? Then if I multiply, If I multiply V times A, V A times V, right? So I'm multiplying, I'm scaling it. So whatever A is, it changes the length of V. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And let's say if A is negative, right? So if A is equal to negative one, like negative one, sorry, negative one times V. Okay. or we could just call it negative v, right? It takes my v and it flips its direction, okay? So negative numbers, when we multiply by negative scalars, we tend to think of it as I separate out the negative and I multiply by the scalar, and then, <clears throat> I mean, it's still gonna change all those different components by a negative number, but what it does is it flips that vector direction in addition to changing its length, okay? So let's do this, I think. <clears throat> Good. So on my example notes, my lecture examples, right, we're going to do some scalar, um, scalar multiplication. So I've got six times, here's our vector, and then here's our scalar. Six is our scalar, one, two, three is our vector, right? So now what I'm going to do is six times v is equal to six times one, six times two, six times three, <clears throat> right? And I can make that through, so it's going to be six v equals I distributed that scalar into each component within my vector. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so let's do this. So we want to show this one graphically. Okay, so if z equals one, one. Here's our z. <clears throat> Three times z. So 3z is equal to, I'm going to distribute 3 to each of these. So it's going to be 3, 3. So 3z is going to be 3z. Okay. Multiplying it through. <clears throat> right. But I can see it. Like if you just had this as a vector and you were asked to graph it out, you can see that's right here. And it's three times as long as my original vector, which is one, one. Let's do this one. <clears throat> so if z is equal to one, one minus z is equal to minus one, minus one. I distribute that negative one to both of those terms in my z vector. Let's draw it out like this. All right, so here's my z. Okay. Now, minus one, minus one, here's my minus z. <clears throat> All right, so you can see how it's gonna flip its direction right, from where it was before. This is my original, this is my multiplied by a negative. This was minus three z, you could see it would flip the direction, but then it would also make it longer. Okay. You guys good? Okay. 
right? So another mathematical property that we want to talk about is subtraction. Subtraction <clears throat> is just like addition, only we're multiplying by a negative one. So I'm going to do the same properties that I did with addition, except that I'm multiplying by a negative one. So if I say something like V minus W, it looks like V plus minus one times W. So you can think about it like that, okay? But essentially what we're going to do is same thing that we did with addition. We're going to do component by component, but now we're going to subtract them. So it's going to be V1 minus W1, V2 minus W2, and so on and so forth all the way out to the end, okay? And like we said before, with addition, <clears throat> these things have to have the same dimension in order for that to work. There's a parallelogram rule for the subtraction I wanna show you. It looks like this. Let's see if I can draw this well. Okay, so if I've got, let's say, here's V, Draw this out like, there's W, okay? So you can imagine, here's my parallelogram, right? <clears throat> and then this would be our V plus W. Okay, that was our parallelogram rule for addition. Now let's remember, if I'm gonna do V minus W, right? It's V plus a negative W. So let's write out our negative W first. So negative W takes our W, and it, I'll do it in green, it takes our W and it flips its direction. Here's negative W, okay? Now you can imagine I have a parallelogram like this, right? And I'm gonna add these two, V plus and negative W together, and I'm gonna get, here this is V minus W, okay? So if you're trying to conceptualize what the parallelogram rule like for subtraction, think about it in terms of addition, but flip the direction of the vector that you're subtracting, and then you can draw it out and see what it looks like. Okay. Let's try this. So we're gonna do example 11. We've got two vectors, y equals two, three, x equals four, one, what is y minus x? We're gonna show this graphically as well, but let's first do it algebraically and then we'll graph it out. So y minus x is gonna to equal to two, three minus four, one. And remember component by component, we're gonna subtract. So it's two minus four, three minus one is gonna give us minus two comma two. So that's our vector answer for the, two sub for the subtraction. Let's do it graphically so we can see what this thing looks like. Okay. So I'm going to graph this out. So my y is 2, 3. So let's do this in different colors. So here's um, y is 2, and this here's y, my vector y. Um, X is four, one. One, two, three, four, here's one. Here's X. So let's do negative X. So negative X, okay. Add more colors. Okay, so negative X, right, is going to equal to minus four, minus one, so one, two, three, four, minus one. Here's negative x, okay, when we go to add these together, and we're going to get minus two, positive two, so minus two, positive two. So here is y minus x, right here, okay. You can see our parallelogram rule, right? This is going to be the diagonal of a parallelogram 
Okay, that's going to be adding y and minus x together. Okay. Everybody see how we did that? Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about um, what's called linear combinations. So linear combinations is just a way of saying, I'm going to combine scalar multiplication with addition and subtraction. Like an equation. Okay. And it's basically a way of saying, right, if I have V as a vector, W as a vector, and let's say I have A and B as scalars, okay, I can combine, I can do scalar multiplication on my vectors, and then I can add and subtract. So I can say AV plus BW, right? You have to watch your order of operations, do the multiplication first, and then add your corresponding components. Okay, or I could subtract them or I can work it. Okay, so we'll do some examples to make it um, clear about how we do this. So my example page. <clears throat> so example 12, we're going to do some linear combinations here. So I've got 3 times 5 minus 2, 7, plus 5 times minus 3, 1 minus 4. So 3 and 5 are our scalars. 5 minus 2, 7, minus 3, 1 minus 4 are our vectors. Okay, so the first thing I need to do is I have to do multiplication first, order of operations. Okay, so I'm going to multiply this out first, so I'm going to multiply out 3. So I'm going to go 3 times 5, so that's 15, 3 times minus 2, 3 times 7, plus I'm going to multiply out the 5, minus 15, 5, minus 20. And now I'm going to add corresponding components, so 15, minus 15, minus 6, plus 5, 21, minus 20. And that's going to equal to 0, minus 1, 1. Okay, Just watch your order of operations, because you don't want to, um, if you add them first and then multiply, it's going to be wrong. Let's do it again. Here's this as a negative. Okay, So this is going to look like negative 2, minus 4, minus 6, minus 8, plus 3 times. It's going to be 27, 24, 21, 18. And now we're going to combine component by component minus 2 plus 27, minus 4 plus 24, minus 6 plus 21, minus 8 plus 18. Okay, putting it all together, <coughs> right? Um, uh, did I do this? This is minus 2, 25, right? 20. 15 and 10. Okay. Everybody follow what we're doing so far. Good. All right. So some other stuff, but also mathematical properties, but these um, particularly about vectors. If we talk about a unit vector, when we say what is the unit vector? A unit vector is where I take um, this one basically, we'll write it out what it means first. So it has a magnitude equal to one, right? But what this really means is I've taken a vector and I've divided by its magnitude, okay? Which is also what we said was our mathematical um, algorithm for calculating the direction of something, okay? So a unit vector has a magnitude equal to one. Okay, but how I actually arrive there is I take that vector and I divide each component by its magnitude. Okay. So <clears throat> in example 13, we have the vector 2, 3. We're going to calculate the unit vector for this. Okay. So um, that means I have to calculate right, its magnitude first. So y is 2, 3. So that's going to be, remember, our magnitude is square each component. I have to sum up the squares and then I have to take the square root. Okay, so this is going to be radical 
4 plus 9, which is radical 13. Okay, so this, <coughs> my magnitude of y is equal to radical 13. So now my unit vector, which we also said was the direction, was equal to my y divided by its magnitude, which is 2, 3 divided by radical 13. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to we're going to um, check that we're going to check the magnitude magnitude of the unit vector. Okay, so watch what happens. So this is equal to two over radical thirteen, three over radical thirteen. I just distributed that radical thirteen from the denominator into each of my components. That's my unit vector right here. Okay. Now I said that that means it has a magnitude equal to one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the magnitude of this unit vector, right? So I'm going to go magnitude y divided by y. So now what's going to happen? I'm going to take this 2 over radical 13 squared plus 3 over radical 13 squared square rooted. And watch what happens. So 2 squared is 4 over radical 13 squared is 13, right? <clears throat> 3 squared is 9. Over radical 13 squared is 13. 4 plus 9, that's 13. 13, which is equal to radical 1, which is equal to 1. So we've just sort of proven it, right? We've shown, we did a quick check. You don't have to do this. If I ask you what's the unit vector, you can just give me this. But I'm showing you, right, that the magnitude of our unit vector is equal to 1, which is our definition of it. Okay. Okay. Another important concept is the concept of parallel vectors. I remember from geometry days, right? Parallel, if I have two parallel lines, right? They're like railroad tracks. They're never intersecting each other. So railroad tracks, so I've got these two vectors, right? <clears throat> they may have the same you know, magnitude, they may not, but they definitely have the same direction, okay? So we say vector V is parallel to vector w, we write it like this. This stands for parallel, okay? If each component, or we'll say, if they are scalar multiples of each other, okay? Now what that means is each component of v and w have to have the same scalar multiple, okay? So that means that it must have same scalar multiple for all components. If even one of them isn't a scalar multiple, then it's not parallel. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll try example 14, we'll show you. Are they parallel? So there's a way to check. You can kind of look at it. One, two, three, two, four, six. You can you can kind of get a feeling for it. But let's do the whole check. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each component and I'm going to set it up like this. I'm going to go one equals, I'm going to pick some variable. I'm going to say a, a times two. So this component here is a times that component. This component here, I'm going to make it the same, a times four. This component here is equal to a times six. <clears throat> now I'm going to solve for each a and then make sure like they are the same. Okay, so on the first one I'm going to get one divided by two equals a, right? This is two divided by four equals a, which is the same thing as one divided by two. This is 3 divided by 6, which is the same thing as 1 half. So the a's are the same, the same scalar multiple for all components. Therefore, we can conclude that these two are yes, it's parallel. Okay. <clears throat> Now on this one, I'll set it up the same way. So one equals a times two, two equals a times five, 
3 equals a times 6. It seems you can kind of get a feeling for it, right? So I'm going to solve for a. So a equals 1 half. I solve for a here. a equals 2 fifths. Well, it bombed out right away, right? Already. I don't even have to finish it because I have um, a's don't match. Therefore, no, not parallel. Okay. <clears throat> as soon as you get one set that doesn't match, that isn't true, okay, that they're not the same scalar, you can just stop. You don't have to go through the rest of them, okay? But as long as they're all the same so far, you have to keep checking to make sure that they're all the same, okay? So these two are parallel, these two are not, okay? Because this one bombed out right there, all right? <clears throat> Okay. Just um, a quick uh, wrap up on um, some extra stuff. I just want to, for chapter 1.1, just some extra things I want to cover. There are what we call unit basis vectors. There's a whole um, range of things, topics in linear algebra that we um, use unit basis vectors for. Okay, we're really not gonna be covering a whole lot of it. We're just gonna um, manipulate unit, unit basis vectors a little bit, but there's a whole you know, wealth of topics within linear algebra that we would use unit basis uh, vectors for. Let's talk about um, in two dimensions first. Writing very well. <clears throat> what it means is, I call, it's like i, j, k are the unit basis vectors i, so in two dimensions, I've got I go one direction in my x direction, one unit in my x direction, and zero in my y. And j, I go zero units in my x direction and one unit in my y. It looks like this. Like that. Okay, that's my i and my j. <laughs> In three dimensions, i is 1, 0, 0, right? I have my x, my y, my z. My j is 0, 1, 0, x, y, and z. And my k for the third dimension, 0, 0, 1. And it looks like this. <laughs> okay, I'll draw it in a different color. So I would have gone out one in my x direction, one in my y direction, and one in my z direction, i, j, k. I can represent any vector as a linear combination of unit basis vectors. And say my vector v is equal to 5, 3, 7, right? But I can also represent this as 5 times i plus 3 times j plus 7 times k. And it goes like this. It's like saying 5 times 1, 0, 0, plus 3 times 0, 1, 0, plus 7 times 0, 0, 1, right? So this becomes 5, 0, 0, plus 0, 3, 0, plus 0, 0, 7. When I add them up, I'm going to get 5, 3, 7. <clears throat> so these two here are equal statements, okay? They're both um, correct ways of representing a vector. Okay, but we represent it with unit basis vectors as a linear combination. We represent it just as a set of components. Okay, we're going to use both throughout the course. So I just wanted to make sure that you guys had that. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that's chapter 1.1. Um, any questions on this before um, I start talking about? I'm going to do 1.2 and then we can, um, if we have time, we'll, we'll break for some classwork. And then you guys will have plenty of time to work on classwork um, in our classes as we go along. Yes, good.
Explain the last part again. This part right here? Yeah, so it's just another way of representing vectors. Now, I'm, I'm only touching on a little bit. Like I said, the whole, whole purpose of unit basis vectors is a big um, topic of discussion in linear algebra. Um, and I'm only just covering the surface of it right now. But it's basically like a one unit vector, right? So I go one unit in the x direction. I represent that as, as an i. One unit in the y direction. I represent that as a j. And then one unit in the k direction, in the z direction, I represent that as a k, right? So zero, I've only moved one unit in the z direction, only moved in the x direction, only moved in the y. So vectors themselves, whether they're two-dimensional, three-dimensional, whatever, um, <clears throat> I can represent as a linear combination of i times i plus three times j plus seven times k, right? Because i, as a unit basis vector, stands for one, zero, zero. J stands for 0, 1, 0, and then K stands for 0, 0, 1. It's an alternate way of representing vectors, and they're both equally valid. We'll use them both throughout the semester, and this right here was just showing you substituting in 1, 0, 0 for I, and so on and so forth, and then combining them so that you can see that they're the same thing. Okay, but it's it's just um, it's what we call unit basis vectors, and, um, and I'm only just touching the surface of like their whole purpose and what we can do um, with linear algebra. But we we do actually use them. You know, I I mean I like it. I like vectors kind of like this format. But um, there are reasons why you would want to use it as a linear combination of unit basis vectors. And so just to make sure that you have that um, language, you know, so that you can see that there. Okay. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about um, chapter 1.2, and then um, and then we'll we'll break uh, hopefully, and then we'll have time to take a look at some of the classwork so you guys can practice it. Chapter 1.2. Okay. So chapter 1.2 is all about um, like a vector representation of a line. Lines and planes. We'll talk a little bit about planes. We're mostly gonna focus on lines. So, you know, when we've talked about straight lines before, you know, like in our algebra classes and stuff, we talked about y equals mx plus b gives us the slope, you know, y-intercept, we have an equation that represents it. The problem is then we're bound to a coordinate axis. But if I can represent a line using a vector, right? If I've got a vector, on, and this is my line, right here, what I want to do, it kind of takes it out of coordinate space and it gives me a little bit more power for how I want to be able to manipulate it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I have a vector, let me draw this in a minute. I have a vector V that's on that line and I have a point that's on that line as well. So let's talk about what these things are. So x naught is a point on the line. Okay, and this can be an x, y coordinate. We're going to start off with two dimensions, or it could be an x, y, z. Okay, but it's, it's basically just a point on the line. It's like, it's analogous to, it's not equal to, but it's analogous to how I need the y intercept on the y equals mx plus b in order to define that line as a unique line. I need a point and I need a vector. So V is the vector we say is parallel to the line, okay? And then we typically talk about our vectors pointing in this direction here as like basically originating from that X naught, okay, but it could just as easily have been pointing that way, okay? So let's talk about our um, equation for the vector equation for the line. Okay, so our vector equation for the line goes like this. Now, <clears throat> I need, I'm gonna first write it out and then I'll write out what the components are. So I have my big X bar. This is my, this is like when we say Y equals, or F of X equals, this is my line equation. My X bar equals um, my point on the line. I'm gonna represent this point as a vector because it has multiple components to it, okay? X naught plus T, times V. I'll talk about what T is in just a second. Okay, so let's write down what these things are. So X bar is our, um, 
equation for this corresponds to, in two dimensions, x and y are components for the line. This is our um, general, general line equation. Our x naught is our specific point on that line. Okay, that's this right here. We, we, like I said, it's not technically a vector, but we represent it with the bar over the top because it's not just a single x naught. It's got different components in x naught y naught or x naught y naught z naught, depending on what dimension we're in. So v, we said before, was a vector that's parallel to the line. And then t is what we call a parameter. It's a scalar. And it allows us to generate points along that line, right? So it's kind of like when y equals mx plus b, then if I pick a, a value for x, I can, you know, plug it all into the equation and then generate a value for y. I can get this, can build up the line by figuring out all these tiny little points that are on that line. Same thing for the parameter, right? This is all real numbers. I can plug in any value I want and I'm going to get some kind of x, y coordinate pair that's going to give me another point along that line, okay? So <clears throat> let's write it out like this. This is your big equation. That's the important thing. Okay, we're going to keep repeating that over and over again. Okay, I can break this down into my component pieces, right? So my component pieces. Like this. So I can say x, my x component, right? My x is equal to x naught plus t times v1. My y coordinate is equal to y naught plus t times v2. And if I was in three dimensions, I'd say z equals z naught plus t times v3. Okay, but these are our component pieces. This is also what some books call the parametric equation, where I represent it in terms of parameters. Okay, so I've broken down. I've got my x component, my y component, and I have it in terms of my parameter t. Okay, if I solve for t on each of these equations. on both equations, it's going to give me what we call a symmetric equation. So let's do this. I'm going to solve for t here. So I'm going to get um, x minus x naught divided by v1 equals t. I'm going to do the same thing here. y minus y naught divided by v2 equals t. This is the same t. I can set these equal because it's the same t. So what I get is <coughs> x minus x naught all over v1 equals y minus y naught all over v2. And this is what we call a symmetric equation. Okay, all of these, these three, right, are all just different representations. They all come from our vector equation, okay? They're just different ways of representing it. They give us different pieces of information. This tells us the general equation for the line, right? I can break it down into component pieces, and we're going to use this later, okay, in chapter one when we're looking for intersections of things. Okay, we're going to break it down in components. We're going to plug x into somewhere, y into somewhere. Okay, here I've got the symmetric equation. Symmetric equation is great to be able to um, tell if a point is on the line. I can plug it in, see if the equality holds true. This equation is really great for generating points on the line because I can pick a value for t, plug it in, and get my x and my y coordinate. Okay, so all of these things have their places, but they all derive from our vector representation of the line. Okay, we're going to work through examples so that you can see like how this all works. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm looking at um, example one for chapter 1.2, and, um, and I'll try to end maybe like halfway through so we can uh, <coughs> have some time to practice some of this stuff. So there's a line in R2 that's parallel to V. This is our vector V, and it contains the point minus 1, 1. Find and compare the vector, parametric, and symmetric equations. So we were given pieces that we're going to plunk into our equation. So first off, um, I'm going to remember my vector equation is x bar equals x naught plus t times V. Okay, This is a point, and this is a vector. 
Okay. I was given a point on the line and I was given a vector parallel to the line. So I'm just going to plug those in. So the vector equation is going to be x bar equals the point minus 1, 1 plus t, my parameter, times 2, 3. I just plugged it in. That's my vector equation for this line. Okay. Let's do our parametric equation. which takes this and breaks it apart into component pieces. That means my x is equal to just my x components, minus 1 plus 2 times t. My y is equal to just the y components, 1 plus 3 times t. Okay, see how I got these from this one. Okay. Incidentally, right, I can pick a value for t and generate a point on the line. So let's do that. So we'll pick a value for t. So if I pick um, pretty easy, t equals 2, right? And I plug this in. That's going to be x is equal to minus 1 plus 2 times 2. <clears throat> so 4 minus 1. So 4 minus 1 is equal to 3. y is equal to 1 plus 3 times 2. 6 plus 1 is 7. So a point on the line is equal to 3 comma 7. We just generated a point on that line. But choosing a value for t, I could pick other values of t, and loop through from 0 to 1,000, and generate all these points on the line. Okay. That's my parametric. Let's do the symmetric. equation. Remember, I'm going to solve each one for t and then set those t's equal to each other. So that means I'm going to go x plus 1 divided by 2 equals y minus 1 divided by 3. Okay. So we just said 3, 7 was a point on the line. So I'm going to check is the point 3, 7 on the line. Okay, so I'm going to go Plug 3 in for x, 3 plus 1 divided by 2. I'm going to put a question mark. I'm going to go 7 minus 1 divided by 3. 3 plus 1 is 4 divided by 2. That's equal to 2. So 6 divided by 3 is equal to 2. Check. Yes, it's on that line. You can see what it'll look like if I go, um, let's try, uh, what did I try? Maybe 5, 7 on the line. We're gonna check that, right? We just said that 3, 7 was on the line, so let's try 5, 7. So I'm gonna plug in 5 for x, so I'm gonna go 5 plus 1 divided by 2. I'm gonna put a question mark equals 7 minus 1 divided by 3. So this is 5 plus 1, 6 divided by 2 is 3. This is 7 minus 1, 6 divided by 3 is equal to 2. 3 is not equal to 2. Therefore, 5, 7 is not on the line. It's not a point on this line. In case we just did a quick check. Okay. <clears throat> so these different equations have different, um, you know, they're different uses, right? And they can tell us different things. Okay. Uh, can you go back to the parametric equation? You bet. Like, what happens if, like, when you pick a point and, like, say you pick zero or one, like, what happens mm -hmm. then? Yeah. So if I pick zero, right? Because t is all real numbers, so I can pick any any value that I want. Okay, so if I pick t equals 0, then I'm going to get, right, minus 1 plus 0 is my x, and then 1 plus 0 is my y. So minus 1, 1 is a point on that line. Thank you. Right? Yeah, you're just generating. So this one is really great for generating points. You can imagine like a computer program, right, where I say, you know, um, <clears throat> I'm going to loop through for all values of t between minus 100 and positive 100. And then for all of those values, I'm going to generate x coordinate and a y coordinate. And then as I get that x and y coordinate, I'm going to plot it. I'm going to plot a dot. So I'm going to have, you know, some line that's going to build up dots, right? And it's going to go through. So when t equals 0, minus 1, 1 is the point on the line. Okay? That's good. 
So let's try this one. So we've got an R3 now. There's a line in R3 parallel to our vector and it contains the point 2, 1, 3. So we're going to write vector and parametric equations and we'll use t equals 2 to determine a point on the line. So this is the same thing that we did before, only now we're in R3. So this is the joy of my vector equation is x naught plus t times b. <clears throat> I have a point, I have a vector, so my line equation equals my point 2, 1, 3 plus t times my vector 0, 1, 0, minus 1. Here's a vector equation for a line. I can have a line in three dimensions. No big, right? So parametric equation, this is my vector. My parametric. Parametric equations in three dimensions are gonna have x and a y and a z component. I'm gonna say x equals just only first component. So two plus one times t. My y coordinate is one plus zero times t. Right, which would just be equal to one. My z, my third component is three plus a minus t. Okay, so we've got the three equations, two plus t equals x, y equals one, z equals three minus t. Those are parametric equations. <clears throat> then it asks us, use t equals two to determine a point. Okay, so I'm gonna say x equals two plus two, y equals one plus zero times two, z equals three minus two. So two plus two is four, one, one. So when t equals two, our point is four, one, one. Okay, so in three dimensions. This is the can do the um I'm sorry. Would I have any um problems where it's like uh R to the N? You know, um most of the stuff that we're gonna do in this class is um for, for writing equations of lines and, and um points. We're gonna be basically focusing on um two and three dimensions. Um certainly with scale up, you just have to choose different variables. I think we go up to like W and whatever, whatever other variables you want. But typically, I mean this will scale, right? Um, but it, uh, we typically in this class tend to focus on two and three dimensions because although this is a math class, right, you want to be able to apply all this to actually, um, you know, using these as a basis for algorithms for writing, you know, game applications, right? And games are going to be in two and three dimensions. So, yeah, you know that the math will scale, but it's not something that you're going to be using practically. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> what happens now if I have two points and I don't, I wasn't given a vector, right? I just have two points and I need to be able to come up with a vector equation for the line. Well, let's write out our vector equation. So I've got X equals a point plus T times a vector. Okay, in this case, right, when I'm given, been given two points, V is gonna be the displacement vector between our two points, okay? And then our x naught is gonna be the initial point that we choose. Remember our displacement vector is terminal minus initial, okay? So it doesn't matter which point you choose as terminal and which point you choose as initial, okay? So if I choose this one as um, my terminal, and I choose this one as my initial, okay? I have to remember, sometimes I'll often write it down because I'll have to remember this will become a part of my equation and then I'll set up my equation like this. So let's do this, we'll do them both. So the terminal point will be three, two, and the initial point will be minus one, minus five, okay? So let's calculate out our V as a displacement vector, terminal minus initial. So three, two, minus, minus one, minus five. So three minus a minus one is four. Two minus a minus five is seven, okay? So now my initial point is this, my vector parallel to the line is that. So I'm gonna plunk those down into my equation. So my equation looks like x equals x bar, my initial point, minus one, minus five, plus t, 
and parameter times 47. Totally okay. Let's do it the other way. So if I say my terminal point equals minus 1 minus 5, and my initial point is equal to 3, 2. <clears throat> so now my displacement vector looks like terminal minus initial, minus 1 minus 5, minus 3, 2. So this becomes <clears throat> minus 1 minus 3 is minus 4. Minus 5 minus 2 is minus 7. Look, it looks just like that only it's in the opposite direction. Okay, so this is my displacement vector. This was my initial point. So my equation for the line looks like this. 3, 2 plus t times minus 4 minus 7. <clears throat> they represent the same line. Remember, our line goes like this. So this one says my initial position is minus 1 minus 5 and my vector points this direction, this is V. <clears throat> this one says I've got the same exact line, right? So this is my initial position, this is my terminal, so this is three, two. So this is my initial position and now my vector is going this way, right? And this is minus one, minus five, okay? It's the same exact line with the two points on it, the only difference is that V is pointing in this direction and the V is pointing in this direction. But V, right, is just a vector that's parallel to the line. All that means is that T here was negative, okay? If I chose a negative one, you can see how I'm gonna get the same line. If I choose, right, a positive one, I'm gonna get the same line. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter which one you choose as your initial or terminal position, okay? Just mark it because that whatever you choose as your initial point goes into your equation. Okay. What do you guys think? Exciting stuff. <laughs> so what I'd like to do, um, what I would normally do, especially if we were in classes, I'll take a break at this point, and then um, we can start uh, playing with some of the classwork that we had. Like I passed out classwork for chapter one point one, and then. Um, I'll start working with the classwork. I actually can stop the um, I can stop the recording if that makes it easier. But um, we're just basically going to be working through classwork at this point for chapter 1.1. Okay, and we also have classwork for 1.2, but I'm just going to start working through the 1.1 classwork. And then when we meet up again on Monday. I'll finish up chapter 1.2. Okay, and then maybe we can do some chapter 1.2 classwork, right? And then we can talk about chapter 1.3. Okay, you guys good with that? Okay. Um, do you guys want me to stop the video as we work on the classwork? It seems like I'm not really seeing anything.